The victim is a British firm, full of queens. While American films are censored by the Hays Code, which does not allow them to stage adultery, passion or sexual perversity, the British are free to be bold and to show all of that. Basil Dearden is one of those directors who love original subjects. Male homosexuality has been criminalized since 1533 in the United Kingdom. Thank you, Christians. And it will be so until 1967. So, in this 61 film, this is a piece of activism. And Victim, of course, was a, was a considerable breakthrough as a film. It was a big bre breakthrough as a film. It's a very brave film. It's something that Basil Dearden's never been respected or rewarded sufficiently for. Uh, when Basil died and he got that obituary, I was so ashamed that they didn't bother to say it. He actually altered the course of English cinema, as much as Losey did. Because of the first, it was the first film actually to take homosexuality as a serious subject, wasn't it? Yes, it was the first film to, to take it seriously as a subject and present it as a serious subject. Uh, to present it as a problem that was solvable and that everybody had. You know, it wasn't sort of like having uh, some dreadful unknown disease. Lots of people had it. It was a reasonable thing to have. Victor begins in a male environment, building construction. A young man is running away from a construction site and the police is after him. He tries to reach a lawyer, Melville Farr. He needs money to leave the city, but none of his friends can give him any. Out can be read on the scenery, as to push the character to reveal himself or to flee. The police eventually captures him and guesses a plot of blackmail. The inspector understands that this man, Jack Barrett, is nicknamed Boy and is homosexual. He's probably involved in a case of blackmail. 90% of blackmail cases handled by the police target homosexuals. Who's been putting the squeeze on you? Come on, open up. We don't like blackmail any more than you do. Look, I took the money. I stole it and I spent it. That's all. We mean to find out what's behind this, Barrett. You've got yourself in a real jam, son. Look, far better come clean than we can help you. Ah, oh, we're wasting our time, sir. All right, Barrett. Let's see what little solitary contemplation will do. Get in a sensible frame of mind. We'll talk to you again later. All right, off you go. Mac! Put him down. In pretrial detention, Jack hangs himself in his cell. But the police continues the investigation. When he understands why Jack died, Melville Farr, the lawyer, also wants to investigate on his own to find the blackmailers. Out of guilt, as Jack's lover and out of justice, but also to save himself from disgrace. Melville is to be appointed a Queen's Council and this position cannot suffer any lack of good morals. Melville's investigation will lead him to other homosexuals like Harold, Eddie, Fip, Henry the hairdresser who wants to sell his salon to escape all this, and Tiny Calloway, the famous actor who has a relationship with his teddy bear. This film takes the form of a social thriller and is a plea against an unjust law clearly stated in the dialogue. The debate on the legislation and how to approach it. Should you report the blackmailers at the risk of incurring yourself prison for crime? Listen, our apparently calm acceptance of this blackmail must seem very extraordinary to you. But do you ever wonder about the law that makes us all victims of any cheap thug who finds out about our natural instincts? Paying blackmail won't alter the law. It'll only encourage the blackmailer. We've got to pay. Tell him, Teddy. Explain. Uh, if we don't pay, ten to one, we land in jail, with our crime so-called damn nearly parallel with robbery with violence. Man-made laws are never perfect. I'm a born odd man out far, but I've never corrupted the normal. Why should I be forced to live outside the law? Because I find love in the only way I can. You're a star, Calloway. People like you set a fashion. If the young people knew how you lived, mightn't they think that an example to follow? Of course, youth must be protected. We all agree about that. But that doesn't mean that consenting males in private should be pillaried by an antiquated law and made meat for blackmail. If you're old enough to vote, you're old enough to choose your own way of life. Many of us reach the grave without arriving at that stage of responsibility. Do you support the law? I am a lawyer. Fear is in the air the whole movie, and it hangs over almost every scene, even if it's less sensitive nowadays. The gay characters are gentlemen, 
with situations to save and wallets full enough to yield to blackmail. Regarding Melville Farr, it would be incorrect to qualify him as a bisexual man. Clearly, Melville appears as a married man by duty. He and his wife Laura look the perfect couple. A perfect couple in appearance, like Bobby and Ken. Two beautiful plastics, affectionate but without sex. They have no children. Laura quickly understands that her husband is certainly not the man she believed. Their marriage included a form of tolerance from her part, but not the possibility for her husband to have a lover. She confronts him, and for Melville, the truth is not easy to tell. Jack Barrett was indeed his lover. How did you come to meet a boy like that? Back in the spring. After a late session, he... The last buses are gone. That's only once. You said occasionally. I know, I know what I said. Can't we discuss this without taking the whole place into a battleground? You stopped seeing him and he killed himself. It's Phil Stainer all over again. No. It wasn't the same with Stainer. Barrett was... What was Barrett? When we were married, we had no secrets from each other. I made you a promise then. I haven't broken that promise, if that's what you mean. Why did you stop seeing him? He was getting too fond of me. Are you sure you weren't getting too fond of him? Answer me. I want to know the truth. I want to know why he hanged himself. He was being blackmailed. That's why he stole? Yes. Someone found out he was a homosexual and blackmailed him. That's it. It takes two to make a reason for blackmail. Were you the other man? Were you? Tell me everything I want to know. I don't want you to. I'd rather know than guess. You'd been paying for months to stop copies of this going around the temple. Why is he crying? I just told him we couldn't see him anymore. So he knew it was the end. And so did you. Look at the picture. There's as much pain in your face as there is in his. You haven't changed. In spite of our marriage and your inmost feelings, you're still the same. That's why you stopped seeing him. You felt for him what you felt for Stainer. That's not true. You were attracted to that boy as a man would be to a girl. Laura, Laura, don't go on. For God's sake, stop. Stop now. I can't stop. I love you too much to stop. I thought you loved me. If you do, what did you feel for him? I have a right to know. All right, you want to know. I shall tell you. You won't be content until you know, will you? Till you ripped it out of me. I stopped seeing him because I wanted him. Do you understand? Because I wanted him! Despite everything, and especially the injections of her brother, she remains sincerely supportive of her husband, including facing the public shame. It's only whitewash. It'll wash off. What does it mean, Laura? I don't know. Hooligans. Nonsense. Too explicit. This spells oblique blackmail to me. What's behind it? I don't know. Oh, come along. It's beginning to make a pattern. How long have you known? I don't know what you're talking about. Far from the clichés about the alleged perversity of homosexuals, the plot reveals the stories of love, feelings, and a context in which only looks form a possible language between two people. In a pub, for example. British society looks in need for progress. The film shows a negative exhibition because it describes a difficult and hostile reality, even if the scenario takes the side of the victims, 
against a homophobic society. One of the cops and the bartender, for example, represents the Puritan opinion of the time, and the inspector another opinion a little more tolerant. Did Far recognize him downstairs? No, sir. Unless whatever the black man had on Barrett concerned Far, of that I'm certain. But Mr. Far's married, sir. Those are famous last words, Bridie. He took Barrett into his car. No harm in giving the boy a lift? Maybe not. It's a subsequent lift that worry me. Check on Barrett's background, find out if there are any relations, and tell Sergeant Hoyt to guard his Sunday suit. Very good, sir. If only these unfortunate devils would come to us in the first place. If only they led normal lives, they wouldn't need to come at all. If the law punished every abnormality, we'd be kept pretty busy, Sergeant. Even so, sir, this law was made for a very good reason. If it were changed, other weaknesses would follow. I can see you're a true Puritan, Bridie, huh? Well, there's nothing wrong with that, sir. Of course not. But there was a time when that was against the law, you know. Ah, uh, very good, sir. All the same, the whole blooming lot. I thought they amused you. Oh, they're good for a laugh, all right. Very witty at times. Generous, too. I hate the bloody guts. Hey! Well, don't look at me like that. Well, they're just not quite normal, dear. <laughs> What's it matter to you? If they had gammy legs or something, you'd be sorry for them. Sorry for them? Not me. It's always excuses. Every newspaper you pick up, it's excuses. Environment. Too much love as kids. Too little love as kids. They can't help it. Part of nature. Well, to my mind, it's the weak, rotten part of nature. And if they ever make it legal, they may as well license every other perversion. <laughs> Come on, Mickey, this place is getting boring. Let's go and see what the postman brought us. Should be a nice bag today. I think our little efforts might be very well rewarded. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. Tomorrow, I hope. Insincere bastard. Well, what else can you be in this game? The staging uses the contrasting codes of the threaders well known to decipher society. Dirk Bogard, who plays Melvin Farr, plays a risky and strong role. Far from harming his career, the film will boost it. The actor is perfect in his character. It may be said that it echoes with his private life, since he lives a very secret relationship with the man presented as his agent, Anthony Forward. Bogart's early career was suspended by his incorporation into the British Army in 1941. He lived the dreadful liberation of an Nazi camp, The bodies piled up and emaciated, the survivors, the jackets with the yellow stars or pink triangles. I think it was on the 13th of April, I'm not quite sure what the date was. In 41, we opened up uh, Belson Camp, um, which was the first concentration camp any of us had seen. We didn't even know what they were. We'd heard vague rumors that they were there. I mean, nothing could be worse than that. The gates were open, and then I realized that I was looking at Dante's Inferno. I mean, I, re I, I still haven't seen anything as dreadful. And never will. A rather powerful warning, which will incite him to live hidden all his life and to burn evidence of his sexuality. For a film actor, you live um, a rather retired and private life. Uh, we seldom read of you in the show columns. Uh, is this... Uh, do, do you avoid publicity? Is it distasteful to no, you? No, 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 no. I don't avoid publicity. That makes it sound like something really horrid and unpleasant. Um, I don't think publicity is always necessary. I think sometimes publicity is ugly, and I think it's vulgar. And I think then you should avoid it. And I think sometimes it's wiser perhaps to, uh, to leave it all alone than to dabble with a little of it. But the army is also proximity of men. Bogard had his first great love with Tony Jones, a soldier who landed in Normandy. He gives to his friend, Lieutenant J. Donfer Jones, RNVR, at an address in Llandidrat Wells in Flintshire. And he gives him the picture in my room of the cloth tower in Ypres and my silver ring from my left hand. My goodness. Who is this man? Jones. I mean, you don't give a silver ring from mm. your left hand mm. uh, to someone who isn't extraordinarily significant. They had a relationship, and I don't know what sort of relationship, but you know, I suspect it was a fairly intense one. They were very close for a long time. 
And I liked him. He always used to come for weekends in his naval uniform, you know, when they did get away. In 1948, Dirk met Anthony Forwood, an aspiring actor he had just met before the war. Tony's marriage to the actress Glynis Johns had recently fallen apart, shortly after the birth of their baby son, Gareth. His meeting with Dirk quickly developed into a relationship that was more than just professional. Anthony Forwood divorced his wife in 1948 and devoted himself entirely to Dirk officially as his agent. The two men lived together until Tony's death in 1988, including 17 years in Provence. In 1948, Tony divorced Glynis and moved to a house that Dirk had rented in Chester Row. For a time, Dirk's teenage brother, Gareth, was their lodger. I was aware that, that his relationship with uh, probably Tony in the, in the very early days uh, was a homosexual relationship. Um, it didn't really mean very much to me at the time, but it, when I lived at the house in, in Chester Row, I used to, uh, the housekeeper uh, used to give me a tray to take upstairs in the mornings. They shared a room. Um, I suppose it was, I became aware of it at that time. It didn't really bother me very much. Dirk will never dare to tell the audience clearly his love story. When you turn to the back of each of your four autobiographies, the name that figures most prominently and is covered most frequently is that of Tony Forward. Now, he's your manager mm. and he's your closest personal friend. Mm. Um, do you count yourself blessed in him? Oh, yes, very much so. He found me on, uh, on stage in, in rep when he was a, a young... He was in the army, but he was um, an agent, about to be, and said he thought I might have something. I was 18. And uh, we made a pact that after the war, because we thought it would only last a year, that I'd um, go and be represented by him, and I've stayed with him ever since. But it's more than an agent and client relationship, isn't it? Because you, you share this house with him. Yeah, he's here. Whose house is it? Mine. And who, whose taste is reflected in the house? Pfft, difficult to say, really. It sort of grew like topsy all around us. I mean, it, it is a house of exquisite taste, and it does seem to have a kind of unity on it. I wonder whether you had created it together. No, it just sort of happened. It grew. It's all, it's all just... It, I mean, you're very kind. But it's only, it's only all the junk that was, you know, came from the houses in England. It's all just shoved in here in a white room. It looks better. Well, I, I know door. perfectly well that all my life, when I sit in front of an interviewer, and you're not excluded, that you dig, all of you, dig elephant traps or tiger traps, and I know where they are. You can cover them with bamboo poles and bits of leaf, but I'll get round them. I've fallen into one or two in the past and made up my mind I would never do it again. Um, so that's why I'm a little bit defensive, perhaps, and a little bit spiky, perhaps. Even a kind of sense, in the sense... Or avoiding sense. questions by a yeah. elliptical remarks. Right. But you see, in a way, you've done that by a very carefully edited picture of yourself, haven't you? By a careful structure of autobiography. You will allow people to know what it is you want them to know about you. There is no totality of a picture. There is a complete totality of a picture, as far as I'm concerned. But it's, it's all there if you want to read it. But if you're not very bright, you won't get it. You have to read between the lines of everything I ever write anyway. Doug Bogart was a great British actor with a hidden life and a furtive career behind great films. Earlier films, I mean, there were some that were accomplished. Um, you're famous for having shot Jack Warner. Um, <laughs> yes, <brilliant. laughs> and then you moved to a very successful series of films. Um, which were the Doctor films. Mm. When you were working in what many people might consider unremarkable cinema, um, were you striving to do your best within those circumstances? I, or did, were you not all that conscious that it was unremarkable cinema? Now look here, let's get one thing absolutely straight. All I've ever been in the cinema, or in the theatre, or in my books, is an entertainer. 
Nothing more and nothing less. That's all I am. And anything I do, I do to the depths of my gut. I would never, as I said, cheat anyone. I never considered those films as crappy or stupid or whatever they were. They were, they were there to pleasure people. They were there to pleasure people who came to see us. You don't, you don't betray that faith. You don't betray people that have staggered miles in a, in a snowstorm or something to get to the movie to see you. You, you. you do everything you can. And people met and married in movies that I made. They dated a whole world. I have three or four generations of people that I am directly responsible to. I couldn't possibly say that I, I did anything more than do the best of, uh, you know, the best thing I could do, the highest point of my ability, and never once to look down on it. Je suis, euh, je suis maintenant en Angleterre, en Amérique, euh, très euh, respecté, oui. mais quand même, il n'y a pas de l'argent et je ne suis pas box-office. Il faut préciser au public qui nous écoute que le box-office, ben, c'est très simple, c'est la oui, valeur oui, marchande oui, d'un acteur. Mais, mais vous avez tourné avec Lozé, des chefs dœuvre avec Visconti, n'en parlons pas, vous tournez maintenant avec René, vous avez tourné avec Koukor, vous avez tourné avec des grands metteurs en scène, oui. et, et votre valeur marchande n'a jamais été ce que vous souhaitiez Non, non pas tout. Tous les films sont, sont énormes, immenses, 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 ah, immenses euh, succès critiquement. Ah, oui. Mais autour, pour le grand public, non, pas tout. Mmh.